What comes to mind when you think of hacking? For me, it's films like 1992's Sneakers, starring Robert Redford, and the 1999 Keanu Reeves classic, The Matrix. Both of these films depict computer hackers in a sort of underdog role. But in reality, hacking doesn't require a computer or an underdog. Just the ability to subvert a system and its reliance on a set of rules. Hacking can be both good and bad, with the former helping a system to evolve and the bad often making the rich and powerful even more so. But how do we best defend against these bad hacks? And what level of complexity has and will AI add in the past, present, and future? These are some of the subjects expanded upon by renowned security technologist and New York Times bestselling author Bruce Schneier in his new book, A Hacker's Mind, How the Powerful Bend Society's Rules, and How to Bend Them Back. Bruce, thank you for the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me. My pleasure, Bruce. So I guess for the basic context for everything else that we'll be talking about over the course of this next hour, what is hacking? All right. So I define it very particularly, right? Because our view of hacking is, you know, teenager in a hoodie, eating pizza, antisocial, breaking into computers. I'm taking a much more general view. To me, a hack is something that a system permits, but is unintended and unanticipated by the designers. So it's not breaking the rules. Hacking is following the rules in a way that wasn't intended. So you think of a computer hack, they're following, they're doing what the code allows. Right? There's a mistake in the code, a vulnerability. So the hacker is not breaking the code, they're using the code, but for an effect that wasn't anticipated. And I generalize that out to any set of rules. So a good example is the tax code, right? It's not computer code, but it's code, right? It's algorithms, inputs, outputs. And that code has vulnerabilities. We call them loopholes. It has exploits. We call them tax avoidance strategies. And there are black hat hackers. And we call them accountants. And the parallel is pretty robust. And you can think of any systems of rules in this way. And on the subject of tax code, what exactly is double Irish with a Dutch sandwich? Oh, exactly is hard because a lot of these hacks, just like computer hacks, are kind of hard to explain without knowing the details of how the code works. But this is a tax loophole that was used for many years by companies like Google and Apple to avoid paying U.S. tax. And it's a complex uh, bug. It involves the tax law of the United States, of the Netherlands, of Ireland, and also uh, a Caribbean tax haven. So the tax laws of four countries interact in such a way to create this exploit that allows the hacker accountant to save billions in taxes. That's totally a hack, right? The law allows it. It was legal. It's not illegal, but it's certainly unintended by any of the legislators that passed all those laws. And in talking about hacks, and we'll get into specific hacks here in, here in just a second, you also discuss potential defenses for the bad hacks, those hacks that uh, don't have a positive effect on the system that causes that system to evolve, but rather continue to allow what in many cases is the rich and powerful to become even more so. And the defenses include removing the enabling vulnerability, reducing a hack's effectiveness, detecting and recovering from a hack, and then also finding vulnerabilities before they're used. I think in a perfect world, uh, that latter is uh, is the one that's, uh, that's implemented the most because it means that the hack is not there to begin with. You also talk about an economics concept called externality. Why is this an important concept to understand for both hacking and defending against certain hacks? So let's let me let me sort of rewind a little bit. I mean, I, I like that uh, kind of taxonomy you gave the defenses and listening to it, it's what we do in the computer world. Right? We patch vulnerabilities so the hacks don't work anymore. We run intrusion detection systems to detect hacks when they happen and then try to recover. We have incident response. We uh, red team. Right? We look for vulnerabilities in our own systems. We do source code audits, right? We try to find the bugs and the vulnerabilities 
before the code is released. As all of those things have analogs to hacks in the tax code or hacks in financial regulations. So it is interesting how what we know in the computer field can apply out in, uh, in the rest of the world, right? Now, you asked about externalities. And an externality is an economics term. And basically, it's an effect of a decision not borne by the decision maker. So you think about, I don't know, polluting, right? A factory pollutes the river, people downstream die, but the owner of the factory doesn't live downstream, doesn't care, right? That, is an, that pollution is an externality to the factory owner because that factory owner doesn't suffer its consequences, right? So if I have, uh, I don't know, an insecure router, and it becomes part of a botnet, and that botnet, you know, takes down some important uh, web service halfway across the planet. Not my problem. I'm not using that web service. The insecurity of that router is, to me, an externality. I'm not going to pay for more security because I don't suffer the consequences. Someone else does. So in a lot of hacks, the, the benefit of the hack is enjoyed by the hacker. The consequences, if you think about the tax code hack, there's lost revenue, there's, there's consequences to it, is diffuse, is, is an externality. So here I am a billionaire, I figure out a loophole, I save, I don't know, you know, a couple of tens of million dollars in, uh, in taxes. I enjoy the benefit. The cost of that to society is to me an externality. I don't really bear that cost. Hmm. So it's a really important way to think about actually attack and defense, especially defense. Because nobody defends against threats that are externalities, because it's not their problem. And a lot of what we do in cybersecurity, when we try to deal with incentives, is to make the entity who can fix the problem responsible for the problem. And if you give, permit, I'll give you one good example of that from cybersecurity, and that is credit cards. So in the old days, credit card fraud was largely paid by the, by the consumer. Hey, you know, your card was lost or stolen and it was used for a couple of weeks. And, you know, you were on the hook for that unless you could prove you, could prove you called them. But if you didn't know, uh, that changed in 1975. Hmm. Congress passes a Fair Credit Reporting Act that limits personal liability for credit card fraud to $50. No matter what happens to my card, the maximum I can be charged is $50. The credit card company is, is on the hook for the, all the rest of it. So now, post-75, credit card companies are losing money to fraud. They weren't before because they were passing it to the cruise consumer. Now they are. And we see in the next sort of decade and a half an enormous number of security measures. We saw oh, uh, you know, live verification by, by phone, not just through those little books of expired cards. We saw microprinting and holograms on the cards. We now have expert systems that look through the uh, transaction database looking at fraudulent spending patterns. None of that would happen if the credit card companies weren't liable for fraud. So when Congress moved the liability, take that externality and move it internal to the credit card companies, then we source security. And that's a really good example of how changing the incentives just changes security. Boy, and thank goodness that exists in modern times. I've had it happen to me a couple of different times. I know other people have as well, where your credit and nothing happened. And then, and it, also debit cards. It used to be yeah. until more recently that you were on the hook for debit card fraud, but then that was changed to be under the same rules as credit cards. And hackers are very resourceful about getting all sorts of info. That info and because includes. it's profitable. Yes, it is. Now, I really enjoyed uh, this next part as the father of an eight and six year old, but uh, you point out that kids are natural hackers. Why I love that chapter, so I'm glad you liked it too. Yeah, why are children such natural hackers and how is something called Club Penguin exemplify their resourcefulness here? Oh, wow. I don't know if I remember the Club Penguin story. You might have to do it. So I'm talking about hacking as subverting the rules. So if you think about it, in order to hack the rules, you need to know the intent of the rules, right? I need to know that the intent of the tax code is to collect revenue. And if I find a trick that saves me money, I know it's a trick. It might be legal. I might still do it, but I know it's a trick. Kids don't really have that context. 
I mean, they're thinking outside the box because they don't know what the box is. They don't really understand the intent of the rules. They just know I can't do this. I want to do it. So let's figure out how. So it really makes them natural hackers, actually in the same way AIs are natural hackers, because they don't have the context to understand the rules. Now, the Club Penguin story, I think, is a story of communications. So a lot of, of apps for kids on the internet are designed so that kids can't talk to each other because we are afraid of stalkers. Right? We're afraid of adults posing as kids and talking to kids. So we set up our systems to have very stylized conversations. I think this is a story of kids inventing basically language to get around word blockages. Do I have that right? Uh, yes. Well, they, uh, I think they used avatars to serve as, uh, symbols for certain things because otherwise, right, just... right. So, you know, communication is just so naturally human. Yeah. So if there are blocks, kids are going to get around it and kids are really resourceful. You remember when you were a kid, you, know, you had a lot of free time to figure out how to subvert other systems. You, know, you had nothing better to do than take a padlock and try every possible combination because you had all afternoon and nothing better to do. Yep. And uh, plus you throw in the, the uh, lack of insecurity, which I think fosters even more creativity in young people, which allows them to, uh, like you just said, think outside the box and, and think about solutions that most adults wouldn't even begin to fathom. And, and, and to be clear, I'm in favor of this. Yeah, I think you know a hacker mindset, a way of thinking in systems and looking at the way systems work and fail and can be subverted is a really important life skill. And uh, something that engineers need and people who are like designing the systems of our life, lawmakers need it, social system designers. So uh, this mentality, I think, is important. I mean, I try to teach it to my students, so I, I, I'm totally in favor of it. So don't punish your kids when they do it. <laughs> I promise I won't. So this book is broken up into seven different parts. Part two is basic hacks and defenses. You start in talking about computers with money, things like ATMs and slot machines, before moving on to chapter eight, which focuses on airline frequent flyer hacks. Now, I need to add in here that uh, one of my all-time favorite personal hacks was about 15 years ago when I was flying pretty regularly, I would make sure to book myself in the exit row because it gave you that extra leg room without having to pay for the extra leg room. Well, unfortunately, the airlines ultimately caught on and now they charge yeah, you. Yeah, the they exit. charge you for those seats. That's right. They charge you for the extra leg room as well. But who is David Phillips and how do you hack American Airlines frequent flyer program with pudding? Oh, so this is a great story. And you can find it on the internet. It's, it's the pudding guy. <laughs> so he noticed there was a tie-in you can get frequent flyer miles for buying healthy choice products. And he looks at how it's working and he realizes that the cost, the, the, the cost benefits kind of off, that you get more benefit than cost. And he finds these healthy choice single size pudding cups that sold for 25 cents and bought thousands of them and got millions of frequent flyer miles, like really cheaply. And then of course he gives the pudding cups to charity, he gets a tax write off. So it's, it, it's a super awesome hack. Yeah, you know, he's following the rules, but the designers of the promotion made a mistake, right? They didn't have a like maximum 10 per person or something, or, or you know, they didn't do the math right. So he was able, to hack it. But I want to give you my favorite airline hack. It doesn't work anymore. Sure. This is way more complicated. So I got to set it up. All right. So I am flying for, for work. And I'm flying, uh, let's say, to the West Coast. I live in Washington, D.C. Let's say I'm flying to California, San Diego. And uh, I have a girlfriend in Chicago who I want to spend the weekend with. But my company won't pay for the stopover it costs extra money. I'm flying American Airlines, so I'm stopping in Chicago, but I can only stop for two hours. I want to stop for a weekend. So that's that's my goal. How can I get to stop for a weekend without paying the extra? Okay? So this is back in the time when there were paper tickets and paper boarding passes. <laughs> so I get my company to pay for the flight at the end of the weekend. So I have 
a ticket from D, from DC to Chicago, Chicago to San Diego, or the other way around because it's the return. Okay, from San Diego to Chicago, Chicago to, to uh, DC on Sunday. Have the two paper tickets. I go to the ticket office and I get two paper boarding passes and staple them. They staple my tickets and I take them home, right? Then I call the airline and change my reservation to Friday. So Friday, San Diego to Chicago, Chicago to DC. So I have a new reservation, old tickets. I take the boarding passes off, go back to the ticket office and say, hey, I changed my tickets. Can I get new boarding passes? I get two new boarding passes. All right, so then I have all my paperwork. Now comes flying. I'm on Friday, I take my ticket with the new boarding pass, fly to Chicago, spend the week with my girlfriend. Sunday comes along, I take my second ticket, put the old boarding pass on it, and, and wait to the right time and walk up to the counter. And so I have a ticket for Sunday, a boarding pass for Sunday. I'm not in the computer at all because I'm supposed to fly Friday. But yeah, I got my paperwork. And if they ask me, I have my boarding pass from the connecting flight, which remember, remember I didn't take, but I have the boarding pass. So the, the person at the gate is convinced the computer is screwed up entirely, gets me a seat, I get on the plane. Now that fails completely with electronic tickets, electronic boarding passes, but for years, that was a great hack. And I use it again and again and again. I love that. Yeah, I used to work for a radio station here in Austin that covered Texas Longhorn football. And I had this cheapy staff badge, I guess, that we would use to uh, wear when we were doing remotes. And I would actually go up to, this would have been back in the late 90s, early 2000s. I would go up to the stadium without a ticket and say, hey, well, I'm part of the radio station staff. So I got to get in here now to uh, take care of my job. And the guy would look down and he cer certainly didn't want to uh, add to the line that was already forming in front of him. So it was just like, yeah, get on through. So it was a, a great time before uh, everything was as digitized as it is now. There is a hack of someone who used to sneak into the Oscars. And the way you sneak into the Oscars is you wear a tuxedo and carry a lobster, like a lobster on a plate. <laughs> and you rush in and say, I, I have a lobster. I have to get in. What are you talking about? Yes. Supposedly a lobster on a platter. Probably not anymore used to let you sneak into the Oscars. Same thing with a guy getting into the Super Bowl for X number of years where he would wear this cheapy windbreaker and have a, a big bag of ice on his shoulder. He would walk up to one of the gates and say, hey, I got to get in to give this off to so-and-so. And he would always get let in. I, I don't know if this is still happening, but it was at least through like the first 50 Super Bowls that he did this. Yeah, it turns out if you have like wearing overalls and carrying a clipboard and maybe a hand truck, you can get in anywhere. <laughs> That's right. Now, chapter nine covers sports hacks. Sports are a great example to help the average person understand that not only can hacks be good, but they can really help a system to evolve, which is an idea that you cover more generally in chapter 34 titled Hacking as Evolution. Wow, you know Prince the chapter. I'm impressed. Yeah, thank you. In football, the forward pass was once considered a hack. Same for dunking in basketball and putting a curve on a hockey stick in hockey, of course. Uh, since I read your book, I've learned of a couple of other examples. Dick Fosbury revolutionized the high jump after winning gold at the 1968 Olympics by facing away from the bar while vaulting over it. There's also examples from baseball and ping pong and plenty of other sports. Why is Formula One a really good sport to look at when discussing the value of hacks in sports? So let's talk about this in general, right? Now I'm saying that any system of rules can be hacked. A sport is a rule book. I mean, that's all it is. It's a system of rules. And players and coaches and teams that are looking for any possible advantage. So looking through the rule book and finding things that are just not mentioned or no one's considered, like loopholes. So, I mean, the, the high jump is a really good example. I don't put that in my book, but I, but I remember it that everyone jumped a certain way. And he said, well, if I jump this other way that no one thought of before, I gain an advantage. Uh, cricket in recent years, uh, hitting a ball behind you, like no one thought of it. The rules didn't talk about it. And suddenly it's now a thing. There's a hack and pickleball. There's a shot, I think, called the Larry or the Wally. I don't even play pickleball, but it is. It's something that like is not in the rules. Uh, technical sports racing, 
whether it's auto racing or bicycle racing or yacht racing, it's a lot of technology. It's a lot of places to find an advantage. And also there's a lot of things the rules are silent about just because you can't think of everything. So my favorite Formula One racing story is that in the mid 1970s, a team shows up on the track with a six wheeled car. And everyone says, you can't have a six wheeled car. And the, I mean, I'm, I'm making this up, right? The team manager pulls out the rule book and says, show me. And it turns out that the rules were silent on the number of wheels a car could have because no one thought of it. Right? Now, in Formula One racing, and like about four years later, they amended the rule book. And now, if you read the rules, a car can have no more or no less than, so don't get any ideas, four <laughs> wheels. But very often, the changes in the sport are for the better. Right? So dunking in basketball was originally against the rules. You had to shoot the ball up to come down. But dunking is exciting. The fans liked it. And it was allowed in college basketball first, and then it moved to pro basketball because the fans really liked it. Like curving your hockey stick. We know the name of the player that first realized you can curve your hockey stick. And that means you can shoot the puck faster. Faster, harder, it gets air. It becomes a much more exciting game. Way more dangerous game, a more exciting game. And over the years, the National Hockey League has like three or four times modified the rules on how much curvature is allowed. They're trying to balance exciting with dangerous. But yeah, we can see sports evolve. Uh, there's a person in swimming in the backstroke who would swim at about half of the half of the pool underwater. And he's on his back. He's not breaking the rules. People are saying, like, you're supposed to be doing the backstroke. What are you doing? And now the rule book says there's only so much percentage of the pool you could be underwater where you have to surface to start doing the stroke, right? But you know this is how sports evolve. As players think of clever things that the rules don't permit, but no one's thought of before. The run and shoot offense in football. So I, mean, I don't know. I don't know who, but you know history knows the coach that invented that. Like we're not going to huddle. We're just going to we're just going to play, 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 play. Take the defense completely off guard. And now that is a legit strategy that teams will use. Same with having the quarterback in shotgun. I think it was who started doing that, and he was looked at as a crazy person at first. But now that's as if not more common than the quarterback right. being under center at the NFL level. Yeah, that's interesting, right? And and so here I see you see the game change. And there, I mean, you can imagine the NFL saying, you know, you're not allowed to. I mean, they make rules all the time about what, I mean, tweaking offense, defense, what's allowed and what's not, you know, and they're looking for that balance that makes it exciting, doesn't give either side, a, you know, too much of an advantage. So the hacks that, you know, are, are, you know, make the sport better stick. The hacks that don't, the rules are amended. Yeah, I think performance-enhancing drugs are also an interesting case study. We're not going to uh, continue this part of the conversation much further, but that's one of those gray areas where if something's not illegal and it does help you out, well, of course you want to gain whatever competitive edge you can, but then that forces that league or governing body to come in and say, well, this is actually uh, this is actually cheating, you doing this. You can drink coffee before you play your sport, but you can't ingest this, this, or this. And I think, right. it and then, then there's a question about the stuff that isn't on the list. Yeah. And, yeah. and and the history of doping is, is is filled with this is illegal. So we find something similar that's not mentioned. OK, now we make this illegal. Let's find something similar that's not mentioned. OK, now this is illegal. And again and again, because you're right, there's going to be some things that are legal. Coffee will be legal. Right? Protein bars will be legal. Right? There'll be things that'll be legal. So how do you you you're looking for the advantage of the thing of the thing that's still legal, but gives you an advantage? Right. Very different than cheating. Right. Illegal doping is illegal. That's not hacking. So I want to make this distinction again. Hacking is not breaking the rules. Hacking is following the rules, but in a way that was unintended. 
Part three is hacking financial systems. You write more than once that wherever there's money to be made, there's hacking. Who was Johann Tetzel? How did he hack going to heaven in the early 1500s? And why did the Catholic Church wait until a half century later to close this loophole? Wow, you're asking me like details I often don't remember. So I do, uh, he was the one who was uh, selling indulgences, right? Yep. Yes, that's right. All right, I don't know how much religious theory I want to do here. There's the notion of, of forgiveness in the Catholic Church. And what he's doing is he's selling forgivenesses for sins not yet committed. So kind of like promissory notes of forgiveness. The idea is, of course, to get forgiveness, you have to do penance, which also often involves giving money to the church. Well, if you give money to the church first, you can get a note basically saying, you know, get out of this sin free. Now, this turns out to be a limitless currency, right? You can sell as many of these things as you can print. And now suddenly there's a market in this. And there are resellers. There are scalpers who are scalping forgiveness for the Catholic Church. And it's, it's nutty. And why did it take 50 years? Things moved slower back then. I think that's the reason. I mean, it's not like today where we like, get on a Zoom and figure out what the problem is and then try to solve it. I mean, it takes years and decades to realize something's going on for word to get back to Italy. You know, the problem is, of course, if, you, if, you're, a, if you're a church, like in the middle of England or Germany, you kind of like this. You're, you're, you're making money for your building, for, for food, for doing good works. You're, uh, you're enjoying the fruits of this hack. And it really took uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation to shake the church up uh, to, uh, to close it. You do a great job of going over hacking and banking, financial systems, and computerized financial exchanges. What is high-frequency trading as a good example of computerized financial exchange hacks that really screws the system and a lot of people in the process? Yeah, this is interesting. I think it's definitely a hack because it's not intended. We think of the markets as ways to buy and sell ownership in companies. And high-frequency trading is trading at the millisecond. You know, looking for anomalies, looking for statistical variations, looking for blips or mistakes, and taking advantage of it. And those who do it, you know, make sure that their that their uh, firms are very close physically to the exchanges, minimal amounts of wire, because you know, getting an advantage in microseconds is actually valuable here, which totally subverts the intent of any market, right? A stock market, a commodities market. It's just, now, for the hard frequency trader, these are just numbers. And these, you know, this can be disastrous. We've seen flash crashes. We've seen lots of examples of where high frequency trading overwhelms real, real trading and, uh, you know, causes lots of problems. Luxury real estate is its own special form of hacking. But why do you also refer to luxury real estate as a money laundering machine? Because a lot of financial rules don't apply to real estate. And this is lobbying. That you know, know your customer requirements, anti-money laundering requirements, uh, different, you know, uh, different ways that in a normal financial market, you just can't walk up with illegal uh, obtained money and you know, start investing it. But you can in real estate. Real estate tends to be exempt from all of that. That's why you want it. You see a lot of uh, like Russian oligarchs and you know, sort of other shady uh you know criminals and semi-criminals uh buying new york london paris to some extent uh real estate because it's a way they can park their money and and it's interesting once you park your money in real estate you can get a loan off of it which is suddenly clean money and now you can take that money whatever you want with so this really is a regulatory loophole uh i, I blame the the real estate lobbyists for making sure that those investments are exempt from uh, anti anti money laundering, know your customer, anti terrorist financing, sort of all those laws that try to keep regular financial markets clean. Those of us who were conscious in 2008 are familiar with the term too big to fail, but how is this concept actually a hack uh, according to your book? So I think of too big to fail as. I want to say this. So you think about a market economy. The way 
it's supposed to work is kind of a Darwinian spiral of fittest. Right? Companies make decisions. They uh, are affected by those decisions. The companies that do better are the ones that you know sell products that people want and don't sell products that people don't want. And then there's, there is this Darwinian competition for us, the buyers, and then companies succeed or fail based on how well they do. So you think about a company that is, you know, in quotes, too big to fail. Basically, what they have done is they've made themselves too critical to the nation so that failure would be bad for the country, not just for them. Remember externalities, right? That the failure of a company is now has a huge externality. So, for example, I don't know. I don't know if this is true, but let let's say that uh, Boeing, an airplane manufacturer, makes all the military jets in the United States. They don't, but let's pretend they do. The country doesn't want Boeing to fail because then their military loses out. Right? So that would be a company that would be too big to fail. That, that's, a fa that's a fake example, but that's a hypothetical example. So now if you are a company that's too big to fail, you sort of have this private insurance against making bad decisions. Because you know the government will bail you out. So Chrysler in the uh, 1970s, I think, uh, some of the financial companies after the 2008 financial crisis got bailed out by the government for their own bad decisions. In a just world, they would have collapsed because the Darwinian world, the Darwinian model says, if you do, if you screw up that badly, you die and you were replaced by you know, a company that does better. Right? That's the way the market works. But if you're too big to fail, you're basically getting an insurance policy from all of us against your bad decisions because we will bail you out. And then if you know that, and right, if you know you're too big to fail, you can now be more risky because you are not actually taking the risk. The country is taking the risk. You just get the benefit of the reward if you succeed. So too big to fail is a really interesting hack of the market system because it subverts the mechanism to a company's own advantage by allowing them to externalize risk. Yeah, because Ooh, wow. how'd that go? I think that sounded great. Well, and because this book does such a great job of not only pointing out hacks, but also talking about the way to defend or patch up uh, the loopholes that allow these hacks to begin with, is there a realistic way to reverse this trend in the U.S., Bruce? You know, it really is antitrust. The problem we have right now in many industries is that there are too many monopolies. And this is from like eyeglasses to software. I mean, it's everywhere. There's been so much consolidation, so much monopolization that there's a lot of too big to fail out there. And there's a, and even worse, there's a lot of corporate power that influences policy to ensure that there's more corporate power. So there's, there's, there's this feedback loop. I would hear this in the 2008. If a company is too big to fail, then they are too big to exist. Like we should not, as a matter of, you know, as a matter of social policy, allow companies that whose failure would hurt the economy to be around. Like, like, why do we do that? That seems dumb. And by breaking up the monopolies, you can ensure that failures aren't catastrophic. But if I have 17 companies, I don't care if two of them fail. Right now, so now I got 15. But if I have two or one, suddenly I care a lot if a company fails because it really hurts my overall society. So it really is allowing companies to be that big in the first place. This is one of the many ways that monopolies harm society that are sort of separate from they just charge you more. It turns out that 21st century monopolies don't necessarily charge higher prices. Some do, but they are just better at extracting value in the whole ecosystem. And that's one way, right? They're able to externalize their risk so they can be more risky because they're risking us, not them. In chapter 24, you discuss venture capital and private equity. And while spending hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, uh, isn't a hack in and of itself, 
Uh, they are a part of a hack in a way. So how is Uber hacking the system through VC? Uber's a separate company because they're doing a bunch of hacks. Let's talk about venture capital funding as a hack. Okay. Again, let's get back to the basic market economy. And companies rise and fall as they uh, perform in the marketplace. The better ones do better, the worse ones do worse. And the good ones survive, the bad ones die. And that's the way the market should work. What venture capital funding is, is a separate funding source that allows companies that are losing money to stay in business. Right? So it's companies that in the Darwinian uh, marketplace of ideas uh, of businesses would fail, but are propped up through external funding. And that allows a company to do things they couldn't do otherwise, like sustain massive losses over years in an effort to destroy a market. You see this as a microcosm in, oh, I, I don't know, in the 90s, you hear about Walmarts that be built in town. They would keep their prices really low, go to starve every other business in town. And when those businesses closed, they would raise their prices. Because, because that Walmart could sustain heavy losses over long term, they can engage in that practice. VC funding is kind of like that, right? So Uber, which loses, you know, like 40% on every dollar. I mean, they're, they're like a crazy money losing company. Like they, 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 there's no reason why they should exist. The business model makes no sense. Literally have not had a year where they've been profitable. They've, not had, they've, they've been burning money like it's been going out of style. But they, they are they, funded. Yeah, because I, investors think eventually they'll be the only ones left. Right? They're going to starve out the taxi companies and driverless cars come along. They don't need they don't need drivers anymore, and suddenly they're profitable. So they are being sort of artificially kept alive by VC funding and being shielded from market forces in by people who are betting on that eventuality, and that just subverts. The way the market works. I mean, again, hacks aren't necessarily bad. We might think this is a good idea, but it is a subversion of the way the market works. That's what's important. You know, it's interesting to think about Uber supplanting the taxi industry because in a lot of places, the taxi industry has been disastrous for a long time and needed that's, to, that's right. It needed to be hacked. Now there are exceptions. I you mentioned Chicago earlier. I used to live in Chicago and I love stepping out on just about any street corner and hailing a cab, but in a place like Austin, 20 years ago, you would call for a cab, which may or may not show up hours later. So right, something right. like right. Uber was necessary here, but sure. at the same and, and, time, and that depends on, on density, right? I mean, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, London, Paris, Tokyo, taxis work great. Because you're right. You'd step outside, you'd get a taxi, you go where you're going. In the urban center, right? You're in a Chicago suburb, that doesn't happen. And you're right. You're in a second tier city. You're in Austin. You're in Phoenix. Taxis don't roam the streets. You have to call one. And you're right. If you're lucky, they show up. Uber has been uh, invaluable in, in those areas. Still doesn't turn a profit, but you know, it, there is something very powerful at being able to call a car, seeing on your phone where it is, and knowing it'll get to you. By the same token, how is Uber's refusal to call itself a taxi company, even though it very clearly is uh, a different sort of hack? And there, Uber is hacking the regulatory process. There are a lot of rules that taxis have to follow that Uber wants to basically not follow because they're expensive. So they're trying to play this game that they're not really a taxi service. They're just an app that links drivers and sellers. Never mind that they pay the drivers and all the reasons why they are a taxi service. But they are trying to skirt that line so they can avoid the, uh, the regulations that, uh, that taxis have to follow. You know, no different than uh, Airbnb, trying to skirt all the regulations that hotels have to follow. And, and in the process, undercutting hotels. Right? And that's part of the, uh, the way they're trying to make money. Part five is hacking political systems with chapter 35 being titled hidden provisions and legislation. I'm not going to lie. This topic really ticks me off because it's being done at the hands of those who are responsible for protecting the system. So why are hidden provisions and legislation a uniquely nefarious form of hacking? Yeah, I think there's a lot here. I, don't, I wouldn't call it uniquely nefarious, although 
I, I get your your pissed offness, and I, I I share it. And so these chapters are really about different ways that the lawmaking process is subverted. So let's talk about the system as we imagine it works. There is a bill. It does something. People are in favor. It, people are against it. They discuss it. They vote. You know, whoever has the majority, that's what happens. Right. So how do we subvert that? Well, if I can stick something into a law that you don't notice is there, then you're not going to vote based on it. So we have these bills that have lots of different topics. And there could be a provision dropped in at the last minute that nobody reads and nobody notices. Or maybe it's it's written so subtly that you read it and you really don't know what it does. So you kind of glaze over it. So there are lots of these sorts of tech tactics that lawmakers use to slip things into bills to get passed that wouldn't get passed if they were subjected to the, the normal sort of debate. Uh, must pass legislation. It's another way. Right? I mean, we, we hear about those, these bills that must pass. They fund the military. They fund the government. Right? We have no choice but to pass them. So if I slip an amendment in, and there are ways I can do that according to the rules, you're not going to block the entire bill because of my dumb amendment, even though you think it's a dumb amendment. You don't like it. So now I get my thing passed. There's nothing to do with the bill. Right? So, you know, what's the problem here? Of course, the problem is that these bills are so complicated and have pieces that aren't related to each other. But that's it turns out to be a really hard thing to, to fix. But yeah, there's a bunch of tactics here that lawmakers use to get things into law that they couldn't get if they were subjected to the normal rules of debate and voting. And all right, so it's I, I get it. It's, it's particularly annoying. You could even argue that the names of some of these bills are cognitive hacks, things like the Patriot Act and the CARES Act, which- Oh, totally, right? I mean, and the names of the, they're an acronym that barely works and then trying to turn to evoke certain, uh, certain feelings, like the Protect Our Kids Act. The, you know, like, I don't know, We Hate Scary Ghosts Act. They, they, right? the, these acts have names. As as are the opposite of what they do. But the names are there because, I mean, how could you be against the Save Our Kids Act? What do you, hate kids? <laughs> well, it doesn't actually save our kids. But then suddenly that's a harder conversation. And it doesn't fit on a tweet. So you don't have it. Just like the Patriot Act. Uh, did, Patriot Act's a great example. It wasn't very patriotic, I don't think. But, no, it, yeah, it had a really good name. Speaking of the uh, politics in this country, why are U.S. elections so expensive compared to pretty much everywhere else on the planet? And it's a good question, right? It, it, it's, I think it's several things. One, we're a big country. I mean, we are a huge country. There's 280, what, 20 million people in this country. So that's expensive. And it's a, it's a particularly television heavy country. Right? Because it's so big, there are so many major television markets. And expenditures on television are still huge. I mean, they matter a lot. Uh, so that's one. Uh, two, there are our election cycles are long, much longer than other countries. You know, in UK, you call an election it happens in 10 weeks. Now, our election season is two years long, year and a half, crazy long. So much more opportunity to spend money. Uh, another thing is that the way the rules are, there's a lot of space for soft money, a lot of way for money to flow into politics doesn't go directly to the candidates. So that turns out to be a huge way uh, money is spent. It's a fourth reason in my book that I can't remember. But I just actually looked up the number. I wait, I have it on this piece of paper. It, it, it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find it because it is a crazy number and it's worth saying. We spent $14.5 billion on the 2020 presidential, Senate, and congressional elections. I mean, that is a crazy amount of money. And, and the, reason, the reason it's in this, uh, this is this has got a new talk I'm working on, is I'm looking at the inefficiencies of our system. And, and, and I'm thinking about democracy as an information system. Right? Democracy is a system where we convert individual beliefs and preferences into policy outcomes, into decisions. Right? So it's an algorithm for taking what everybody thinks and turning that into, you know, our trade policy, right? our tax policy, 
our unemployment policy. That's what elections do. And it is a very expensive algorithm. You thought blockchain was expensive? This is even worse. It's an expensive algorithm. Now, my question is, isn't there a cheaper way to do this? I mean, you know, can we figure out who should run our country in a way that doesn't cost over $15 billion? There has to be, right? <laughs> there has to be. I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm working on it. Thinking of it as an information system, and, and plus it's so hackable. I mean, our election systems, and, right, and gerrymandering is a hack, and uh, uh, photo ID requirements are a hack. You know, all of these hacks on the political process, in a sense, open primaries versus closed primaries, that, that's a hack. These are all subversions of, you know, what does the majority of the country want us to do? Which should be a simple question to answer. You know, we kind of know what the majority of the country thinks is a good breakfast cereal. You just hire a research firm, they tell you, super cheap. But, you know, who should be our leader? Costs almost $15 billion. That's nutty. Yeah, I'm glad you right, mentioned. I guess that's a preview of the next book. You, you heard it here first. Excellent. It doesn't have a title yet, and and don't tell anybody. It's still in works. Our little secret. Now, I'm all glad right. you mentioned you and me and all your listeners. That's right. I'm glad you mentioned ranked choice voting as part of the solution here. I think that is one thing that can help us uh, get going in a better direction. But I guess that also remains to be seen. Now, you know, part... we do have it. So I live in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. We have it. We've had it for decades. How does it work? I didn't know this. So I actually went to a seminar. I, I, I don't know if I said, I teach here at Harvard, Kennedy School, yeah. Public Policy School. Mm -hmm. And there was a seminar here like two weeks ago on, uh, it was called Beyond Winner Take All, Different Ways to Do Voting. And ranked choice voting was somewhat popular in the United States in like post-World War II. And it gradually fell out of favor because of the Red Scare. People were afraid that communists and socialists would get elected. So they put back the two-party system and got rid of this way that third parties can get representation. But in Cambridge, which has been super liberal since forever, it never left. So we have ranked choice voting and we've had it for decades. And, and for those uh, you know, watching who don't know what it is, it's a way you can rank your candidates in terms of, you don't just pick one. You look at all the candidates and you rank them in terms of preference. And actually you just tend to rank first, second, third. And the idea being, if your first place candidate doesn't win, your vote transfers to the second place candidate. So if you think about it, if there's a third party you like normally, you would never vote for them because you know that's basically giving a vote to the enemy. So let's say you're a Republican and there's, you know, I don't know, the Libertarian Party. Uh, you would never vote Libertarian because that would give your kind of give your vote to the Democrats. You have to vote Republican. Otherwise, Democrats you know, get an advantage. But in a ranked choice system, you can pick Libertarian first and Republican second. So your vote goes to Libertarian candidate. If they don't win, if they, if they, if they don't get uh, some percentage, they get dropped out and your vote transfers to your second choice. So that gives you the power, the freedom, the ability to vote for a third party without it sacrificing your vote for the major party you would prefer to the other major party. So that allows for third parties to establish themselves. It's really important. It's really powerful. It's a much better way of voting than we have. And there is a movement, it turns out, I didn't realize it, to bring it back. And I think it'd be great for our country. I think it'd be fantastic. Now, even though half of the fringe parties, I'm not gonna agree with. It's still really important. Uh, competition is is good. Competition for is really valuable, and to the extent we lose it, right? Our systems, our systems use competition to solve problems, whether it's politics or capitalism. And to the extent those are hacked, those are subverted, it harms us all. Very well said there. Now, part six is hacking cognitive systems. Bruce, it's hard not to think about social media companies and how they operate. I thought about it. I wasn't writing the chapter, so don't worry about it. Hacking cognitive systems. And you spend a ton of time on the social media companies. The documentary, The Social Dilemma, does a great job of laying out how 
these companies are created and programmed to tap into the reward and behavioral systems of the brain that have us craving more. And while their al algorithms tend to give the user more of what they've been consuming, it's easy to get drawn into outrage, which is a strangely addictive emotion. Uh, you talked about antitrust laws but a little bit. Addictive. You talked about antitrust laws a little bit earlier. So why do you think this is a good solution to the problem that these social media companies pose? You know, because right now, because the social media companies are largely monopolies, Facebook is a monopoly, Twitter is a monopoly, that they don't have any reason to give people choice. They're building the system that maximizes their profits. If there were 20 different Facebooks, there'd be one that would be, you know, a free for all of hate speech. There'd be one that have no hate speech. That we would run optimized for, I don't know, religious discussion, run optimized for students. I mean, there'd be different systems, each kind of doing their own thing. We'd like them to be interoperable, like in the way your email is interoperable. So you could comment and see each other's posts, but each one will be optimized for in a different way. That is a better environment. You see more innovation alternative ideas. If you don't like the way a system is being run, you can move to another. And Mastodon is trying this. So if, if your uh, your uh, audience doesn't know, Mastodon is an alternative to Twitter. It's been around for a while, but it, it got increasing popularity when Musk bought Twitter and basically started setting it on fire. And it is a federated system of, of, of those short messages, of those tweet-like messages. And then you find the Mastodon server. There are many of them. You can choose the one you like. They have different policies. You join one, but you can still follow other people and, and comment to them and read their tweets almost in the same way that no matter what browser you use, you can see anybody's uh, website, right? No matter which email system you use, you can get other people's emails, right? They're, they're interoperate, but they're separate. And if you don't like the rules of one, you can move to another. And I think this is extraordinarily powerful because what we're seeing on Mastodon is that different Mastodon servers have different sorts of rules. And depending on what you like, you'll be more at home at one or the other. And that just allows ideas to innovate in a way that you don't get when there's a single, you know, megalomaniac ruler of Twitter. While you do mention political bots, it's actually in part seven, hacking AI systems, but political bots are a big problem on social media, especially Twitter. For those interested in hearing more on the subject, I'd point to you not only to this book, but also to a recent chat that I had with Sam Woolley on his new book, Manufacturing Consensus. Considering how nobody can even begin to accurately quantify the number of bots on social media sites or elsewhere on the internet, and with how quickly they're evolving, thanks to not just AI, but things like chat GPT, uh, taking that a step further, is there a best defense against bots that are looking to inflict negative responses ranging from anarchy to apathy online, Bruce? This is hard. This is a really hard problem. And you know it's hard because nobody likes it and no one's solving it. Yeah. And, and it's getting worse, right? Chat GPT, you know, it used to be the bots would just you know spew one of a dozen pro-Saudi uh, Arabian slogans. Now it'll generate novel speech on demand at scale. So, you know, what are our solutions? Well, we could demand uh, liveness tests. And so if you have to show an ID to get an account, we know you're not a bot. You could use a bot, but we know that you are not a bot. So that won't prevent bots. That'll prevent the scale. Because each account is tied to a living human being. Right? You have to show up at, uh, I don't know, you have to show up at a Starbucks, you have to show up at a FedEx store, show your ID, you get a code, let you get an account. I just made that up, right? Mm -hmm. You make it like getting a driver's license. You have to be there in person. You can't get a fake one. That would work. That'd be, that'd have a lot of other problems that we probably don't want to have. But as soon as you allow, you know, online registration with little uh, authentication, Bots can now register. So now we have those uh, those robot tests, right? You know, guess the number of pictures that are a boat, that kind of thing. Yeah. Which that same deal. How do we prevent computers from getting accounts from doing the thing? So here's a system that we think that 
don't know. I'm pretty sure the AI could figure out which is a boat. Uh, so I, I, I don't trust it. But that's the idea. Agreed. These things are actually really hard to solve. And as the AIs get more sophisticated, right, as they can produce realistic video, realistic audio, not just realistic text, it gets even harder. No doubt about that. Now, you say that artificial intelligence will hack our society in a way that nothing heretofore has has done before. I know. I was ap 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 apocalyptic, wasn't I? I? It's it's a little bit scary, even though you say, look, the uh, the Terminator 2, uh, the, the Term Terminator 2 theory is probably not going to play out, at least in our lifetimes. But that does concern me along those lines. So how do you envision this playing out then if AI is going to take things to such a next level with regards to hacking? So this is good because we've had the last hour laying the groundwork. So I can really talk about this, you know, quite easily. We're talking about people finding loopholes and sets of rules, right? A new tax loophole, curving your hockey stick, a mileage run in a frequent flyer program, figuring out some delaying tactic in legislation, getting around uh, taxi rules. That is a human creative process. What happens when an AI can do that human creative process? What happens when you feed an AI the entire nation's tax codes? Here it is. Find me the loopholes. And it finds a hundred. It finds a thousand. It finds loopholes so complex, you can barely understand them, but you know they're legal. And that changes things in a really scary way because, you know, we're used to hacking. It's not good. We don't like it. But it happens at this human pace. But once that pace changes, I think things change a lot. And uh, for, for your, your viewers who don't want to necessarily buy the book, if you type uh, the phrase, becoming AI hackers and my name into Google, I did an essay that came out last year, a year before the book, where I talk about just this. So, you know, feel free to read it. I don't know if I, did I hold it up, right? Or you can get the book. It's got a beautiful cover. But if you don't want to, you can get that essay online. It's a gorgeous book. So how much of an existential threat do ha does hacking pose then, Bruce? Uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm not big on existential threats. You know, I think those are largely overblown. But I think it does pose a serious threat because we are not prepared for hacking at AI speed, scale, and scope. We're just not. We are not prepared for a thousand tax loopholes, for a hundred loopholes in our financial networks, you know, for, for for the kinds of things that could happen once AIs do this. So I, you know, I talk at the end of the book about the no, the need for agile government. Right? You find a tax loophole, it takes two years for Congress to patch it if they ever do. That's not going to work when you find a hundred. So we need some way to make our laws, our systems of rules, as agile as Microsoft makes Windows. Every month, you get 100 patches in Windows or more. We don't do that with our laws. But we need to figure out how. Because our laws are as complex and as hackable as a big piece of software right now. Great way to end this conversation. He is Bruce Schneier. The new book is a beautiful one. It's also a great read. It's called A Hacker's Mind, How the Powerful Bend Society's Rules and How to Bend Them Back. Get it now wherever books are sold. Bruce, thank you so much for the time today, and thank you for this crucial book. Thanks for, thanks for having me on. Thanks for reading the book. It's nice to have an interviewer that actually read the book, and I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Bruce. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks to Gentleman Jesus for the intro and outro music. Hear more of his work at GentlemanJesus.com. And thanks to you for tuning in. For more of the show and to connect on social media, visit BooksOnPod.com. We'll talk to you next time. Books on Pod.